All right, good evening, everybody. This uh, this is just an opportunity for, uh, for us to share with each other and for me to share with you some uh, best practices, some tips for re-enlivening Seder, for creating uh, Seder, that, uh, Seder, for making some small changes to Seder that can make a big impact. And I, I have a lot of, um, I have a lot of thoughts about this topic, but I, I'm going to share some thoughts and then also invite for questions. And I'd really like this to be led by the questions. And I'm not the only one with wisdom to share. Um, there, everybody has had the opportunity to have satyrs and uh and i'd love to hear from other people what has worked for you and what hasn't worked for you so the first thing i'd like to say just to start us out is if what the satyr was about was telling the story of exodus we would just open up the book of exodus and read from it the Seder is not about telling the story from Exodus. It, everybody thinks that's what the Seder is about because it's very easy to think that that's what the Seder is about. Um, because clearly the Seder is set. The setting of the Seder is in that moment of telling about Exodus and the special foods and the uh, are all connected to the story of, of Exodus. But what the Seder is really about, the Seder is about how the Jewish people over time have told the story of the Exodus from Egypt. And that's why the central text that we use in the Seder is not the book of Exodus. It is the Haggadah. And the Haggadah means the telling. It's not the story. It's the telling of the story that, that is the important thing. And so I, I, the reason why I start with that idea is because a Seder should engage the participants in a meta understanding, right? It's not just how do we tell the story in an accessible way. But how do we get engagement from everybody in telling their own story and in, in connecting to the story uh, through their own experience of Exodus? And how do we, like in an age appropriate and uh, you know, ability appropriate way, connect uh, everybody who's at the Seder to those to those moments of, of telling the story. Um, so uh, before we go on, I just did, did that surprise you? Is that how you think of Seder? What, what do you think, like how do you think that would, like thinking about Seder that way might impact how you, how you plan for the Seder? Well, it suge suggests that the um, <clears throat> the children's seeing the adults telling the story is an important feature of it. Great. That so this, says, that, this, that this is uh, you know that they're certainly it's important that these people who are big people are telling this story and they're telling it to me, you know. Great. Uh, to us. Bob says, what I get from this idea that that there's an emphasis on the telling and not just on the story is that the people who do the telling are part of it. And it's important for the Seder to also be people focused, people centric. It's not just about the Seder. I mean, it's not just about the story. It's all the Seder is also about the people who are in that room telling that story and 
it's important for young Jewish people to see older Jewish people engaged in that story, right? Like having adults who are engaged is a part of this of this uh, practice. Nice. One of the things that you're saying makes me think about the fact that <clears throat> we are telling the story and we are part of the story. So it's not pulling out the book and talking about them exclusively, but we are, it's said over and over again, for sure. But right. it's our well, it's, story. Right, good. So one way to connect, one way to tell the story one way to engage people of all ages at the story, uh, uh, people of all ages at the Seder, is to ask them to really put themselves, to think about their own personal life and the resonances of this story with life. And, uh, you know, I had the opportunity this Sunday to, uh, to go to, to experience Freedom Song which is a which is a story of addiction and the Passover Seder and the way in which a person who struggles with addiction might be able to talk about slavery and what it means to be in recovery from slavery. Um, and everybody, you know, life, just living life is traumatic. And there are ways in which, childhood is a certain kind of slavery and in which adulthood is a current like is a certain kind of slavery and which parenthood is a certain kind of slavery and in which a job that you have is a certain certain kind of slavery uh, and then you have to think about in what ways is childhood a kind of freedom and in what ways is adulthood a kind of freedom and in what ways is parenthood a kind of freedom and in what ways is my job a kind of freedom and you can uh, you can explore for your own life in what way have you experienced constriction or narrowness and in what ways have you experienced something that is closer to freedom. Nice. So Mishka, uh, I, I think that's a really good point, right? You have to put yourself into it. Who is doing the telling is going to make a dramatic difference in how the story is told. Um, Rabbi? Yeah, because we have two seders, we, what we used to do is first seder would be more traditional and go through the Haggadah, and then the second night we would have the girls be in charge, and we would, you know, have to look for the Afikomen and all that, and they would tell it in their version. So that was kind of cute. They used the children's Haggadah, and there was a children's Haggadah, yeah, sometimes. That, that's a, a wonderful, yeah. Thank you so much for share, like sharing that. Um, right, that the we are blessed in outside the land of Israel with the opportunity to do this twice every year on consecutive nights, and that means that we have two opportunities. We can tell the story in two different ways every year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I would I would go so far as to say that if you're doing the same. Uh, the same if you're with the same people and you're using the same Haggadah and your feet your 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 the way that you read through the Haggadah is exactly the same on the first night and the second night of Passover you're not doing it right right <laughs> like you should have different people at your Seder or you should go to the synagogue's second night Seder um <laughs> Uh, which we'd love to have anybody who wants to come at. And if you haven't yet signed up and you're thinking about it, ask me at the end about this. Like, what are your concerns? I, I want to alleviate those because I'm really excited about our synagogue second night theater. Uh, anyway, I, all of this to say, um, you should do two different things. So I love, uh, I love what you just shared um, about, right? The, the first night was, is led by the adults and the second night is led by the kids. So the first I night, the adult, first night, the adults hide the Afi Komen and the, and the adults read through the Haggadah and tell the story to the kids. And the second night, the kids do a play. They tell mm -hmm. the story in their own way. You know, 
Um, they get to hide Daffy Coleman, right? So, and there's like a nice, there's a nice balancing there. Mm -hmm. um, growing up, uh, we always had, every Seder that we, we had had a different theme, okay? Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you do a theme for your Seder, you should do a different theme on the first night and the second night it should feel different. What kind of themes did you do? So all, all kinds. So um, we, one year when it was uh, 350 years of Jews in the new world, we did, uh, we did like American Jewish uh, 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 stuff. So everybody had to, like that was the theme and you had to bring some something that connected to the Seder that was on that theme. Oh, so this is, this is, a, this we're starting to get to the, like the, the tips and tricks for how to prepare for Seder, but a, a crucial, so, so far we've talked about the framing of thinking about Seder as not about telling the story, but about thinking about how we tell the story. Okay, I, I think that's really crucial. There are other uh, tricks for how to prepare for a Seder. Another trick is to assign everybody who's coming it, to your Seder a part in advance, okay? Now, if you are just having Seder with your family, every individual might have a different part. If you are inviting three other families to come to your family's Seder, then you might assign parts by family instead of by individual, okay? But mm -hmm. how does that work exactly? You, the Seder leader or Seder leaders, the hosts go through the Haggadah. First, you have to pick some kind of a, of an emphasis. You can't focus on everything every year or at every Seder. So you focus on an emphasis. Say your emphasis this year is on um, the concept of moving from Gnut to Shevach, okay? Moving from, uh, from degradation to praise, okay? This is a, a, a theme that repeats in the Haggadah over and over. Okay, for example, Avadim Hayinu, we were slaves in Egypt, now we are free. Okay, so we're start with the degradation, move to the praise. Okay, and the, the Talmud actually has a discussion where they say, how are you supposed to tell this story? Again, like, in what way are you supposed to tell it? And the answer one of the rabbis gives is start with degradation and move to praise which is why at the end of Magi, at the end of the part where we're telling the story, we have Hallel, verses of praise. But then we also have Hallel again at the end of the Seder. The reason why we have it twice is because we actually tell the story twice. First, we tell it in the Magi, and then we tell it through our actions of eating the sacred foods. But both times, we end with, with verses of praise. So, and we move from degradation to praise. So, so you start by picking a theme, you know, degradation to praise, uh, the four children as a, as a theme. So one year, everybody who was coming to the Seder was assigned a different child from the four children. And they had to respond to every part of the Seder from that point of view. Mm. Okay. Or another way to do it is you say, okay, the theme is the four children and every family that you assign a different part to, okay, you're doing this page and add to this page and you're leading Dayenu and you're leading whatever, but you, as a family to prepare uh, what you're going to present is going to be Dayenu through the eyes of all four of the children. So your family is responsible for presenting, you know, four different points of view about Dayenu. Okay. And then because you've assigned these Seder assignments in advance, right, you, you invite people to really engage with, uh, with, the, with, the, with the Haggadah, with how to tell the story, even before they get there. 
That is a crucial part, right? It's not enough to just have the Seder leaders be thinking about this in advance. All the Seder participants should also be thinking about how to tell the Seder story in advance. Um, so that's a, that's a crucial uh, uh, trick for, for how to have a successful intergenerational Seder. And you can do it in a way that engages also the kids. Like for example, um, everybody has to bring an object that's connected to the Seder, okay? And then when we get to that point in the Seder, you have to show your object and explain your object. Show and tell is a thing that even in preschool kids are doing and know how to do. And so, and you can do it at simple levels and sophisticated levels. So I remember, right, you have to really think about what object do you wanna bring and what is the tie-in of that object to the Seder? So, you know, maybe you bring a doll and you think, okay, this doll represents the courage and bravery of the midwives in saving the Jewish babies, uh, right? And so when we get to the part where we're gonna mention the midwives, then we're gonna definitely, men like this doll connects to that. Or you might, uh, or you might bring uh, your backpack and it's like, okay, if I was going to leave Egypt and I had to only fill a backpack, what would I fill it with? And so then you you bring that out when it's like, and they left uh, in haste and they couldn't even uh, let their dough have time to rise. And that's like a perfect tie-in to bring in a backpack, right? And so ev every person can, in their own way, like have a physical object that connects to the story. I really uh, like that. Yeah. Do you want other theme examples? Uh, yeah. One year we did. Um, one year we did sort of bibliodrama, where instead of so the way bibliodrama works is everybody gets a role that they that they that they in, in, embody that they inhabit, but then you like pause the drama. And you say, and how are you feeling right now? And what is your character feeling? And what are you feeling after having experienced this character, right? So, and then you can set up the bibliodrama in different ways. Like, wouldn't it be interesting to have at your Seder an Egyptian person who wasn't involved in the government? Right? What, what is it like to have just your average Egyptian person? Like, how did they experience the plagues? How did they experience the Exodus. Were they angry at their Pharaoh? Were they jealous of the Jewish people? Did they want to tag along with them? It, when they saw the Jewish people marking their door with lamb's blood, did they think to also do that? Right? So you can you can really get into um, the right and, and it, it isn't a far leap to be thinking about your, you know, righteous Egyptian, to then be thinking about righteous Gentiles, uh, right, at, you know, like normal bystanders, like in what way are we complicit in other people's slavery, right? Today, we as Jewish people in the United States, like, are we like more like the Egyptians or are we more like the Jews, right? There are so many questions that you can engage with around that kind of a, of a, like of a, of a bibliodrama of setting it up. Well, some, uh, if I might say, some of these things sound kind of sophisticated and demanding on the people coming to the Seder, which, you know, I'm wondering how you adapt this to a four-year-old or to a five-year-old or to a three-year-old for that matter, you know, but, uh, you know. Because right. it seems so, like, like it's I a said, leap I, there, you know. Right. I, I think having a physical object, right? Right. The the theme where you have the physical object, that works really well for, for folks who are young and 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 can be more sophisticated. Like that 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 has like 
a level of concreteness that can also be sophisticated. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think with 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 young young kids, that's a great way. That's a great that's a great theme, right? Mm -hmm. Another theme is to have the theme of asking questions. Okay, so and young kids really love to ask questions. They like to ask why. They're very curious mm -hmm. about things. You know, the Maimonides says, okay, maybe it's not Maimonides, maybe it's the Mishnah. If, if you get to the part of the Seder where the, where the young people are supposed to ask questions and nobody is asking any questions, you're supposed to throw nuts at them until they start <laughs> asking questions. Hmm. What kind of nuts? Um, like uh, all, uh, almonds, walnuts. You're supposed to throw <laughs> nuts. Would have been the nuts. Right? Then the question, the, of course, nuts. the question, of course, that you ask is, why are you throwing nuts at me? Okay, right? But the, the point is not what question you ask, but that you're engaged in the process of asking. Right. Okay, because any question at the night of Seder, any question, the night of Seder can have an answer that connects to the story or how we tell the story. And so the, there's no bad questions and questions are a crucial part, right? Like the four questions, those are a script that you're supposed to give to people who don't ask their own questions. Hmm. They're 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 a jumping off point. They're not like oh. not like you know. Okay, if the seder was really all about those questions, you'd expect us to answer them, right? But the Haggadah does not contain an answer to those questions. So that shows you that it's the point is asking the questions, not answering them. Um, all right, so, so far we've talked about, uh, the telling of the story and thinking about, like, reframing in your head that the story is not the point, telling the story is the point. And we've talked about picking a theme, and we've talked about asking people, including young kids, to prepare in advance, to do some, some preparing before you come. What question are you... I, I have to say, I just love that, that the preparation is necessary. I know with with um, our four year old, um, in part because of the PJ library contributions, there is a lot of opportunity to be preparing. Um, and that's been wonderful. Uh, one of the books that we read when we were visiting weekend before last was about the plagues. And there were questions clearly like, what is a slave? And I mean, he was aware of a lot of the stuff, but wanted my opinion about it. Not just dads or moms, he wanted mine. But the idea, especially knowing this particular child, having something that he can bring forth and show everybody. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. that's gonna be wonderful. Right, like engaging, having each family be responsible for a particular section of the Seder right, also means that it's not just that the kids have to prepare something, but that their parents have to be actively working with them to think about how to structure that section. Mm -hmm. And also, if, if you know, another way to do it is not to have a theme, but to say you are responsible for assigning parts for your part that you're doing, right? So if you're doing Dayenu, Right, you're also responsible for figuring out what everybody else is doing at Dayenu. Um, so so that's another way to do it. That's sort of like you're also you're also giving away some of the like cedar leader responsibilities to the to the different people when they're leading their section. They are actually the cedar leader, and not just a participant. Um, okay, also good. So. So those are some of those. So now like some practical, uh, practical things. And I know I've told you and uh, I've done Mishka and Bob this before, but um, there's a 
a custom that you're supposed to be hungry when you eat the matzah. I think this custom is completely complete narishkite and a bad custom. A, uh, not that you, not that like, it shouldn't be special to eat the matzah. It should be, right? And I don't eat matzah or any matzah product from Purim to Passover so that my first taste of matzah is like, is really special, okay? But you actually, like, you do a cup of wine at the beginning and then you do the vegetable course, karpas, which really means appetizers, okay? And if you are only serving parsley dipped in salt water, I think you are you are not doing enough appetizers. Parsley is not a filling appetizer. <laughs> um, so obviously parsley is a green vegetable that's so nice. It's like connected to the spring and and the salt water is the tears, right? Or it's, it's in some parts of the world, people don't use parsley, they use potatoes. And in some parts of the world, they don't use salt water, they use vinegar. Okay, the idea, the, the idea is still follows through, right? That it's like the 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 tears, okay. But any vegetable is okay to be eaten at that time of the Seder, right? You you're not gonna serve your brisket at that point or your right, but anything that's a vegetable that you would say the blessing Bore Priyadama on, you can serve at that point. So growing up, we would start Seder and we would do Kiddush and the hand washing. And then we would serve a vegetable course. And it would have artichokes dipped in pesto and asparagus dipped in garlic aioli and uh, roasted carrots and roasted beets and roasted potatoes and roasted sweet potatoes and parsnips and and um, and it would have um, uh, crudités and uh, broccoli and uh, celery for a dill dip and uh, uh, baby carrots and cherry tomatoes and um, jicama and uh, anyway so like a lot of food and that food then everybody ate right and then that food stays out for the for the for the next for the whole magi so that people can keep eating and that that means that people are not going to be constantly asking when's dinner when is this going to be over right? When do we eat, right? Instead, people are going to be focused on the theme or the topic or the Haggadah or whatever. And, and then you can also, like, if it's all, all of those vegetables, you can keep dipping, right? Like, dip, make a lot of dips and have vegetables in lots of different kinds of dips. If you want to get creative about it, you could have each dip be symbolic of something, right? Like, and 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 you think about what does this symbolize and what does that symbolize and what are the what do the asparagus spears symbolize and what does the artichoke symbolize and all that sort of stuff. And like, you don't have to do that. You can just be like, yeah, we're eating vegetables because this is the four spice. This is the appetizer. This is the first course, which is what it was supposed to be, right? That is. The Seder is modeled after a Greek symposium, right? You you didn't starve yourself to talk philosophy. You like ate grapes and uh, uh, you know and 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 appetizers for the whole first part of the meal. Not to speak of the fact that right, if you go to a fancy meal like a say a wedding or whatever, a, a gala, an event. Right, you expect to be served a little uh, appetizer before all the speeches. <laughs> anyway, right? Like that's that's completely reasonable, uh, and 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 it's it's crazy that we don't do that at Seder, or that a lot of people don't. 
So I, I highly recommend, hey, happy birthday. I know it was yesterday. Oh. I can't believe how old you are. Good, thank you. <laughs> oh, how old are we? Novice four. Ah. Four. Four. Four, that's a good age. <laughs> that's a very good age. Beautiful. So I think, I think that's a huge, that's a huge um, trick for making it reasonable to, to extend Seder a little longer and to go a little deeper. Um, all right, so that's good. Uh, another, uh, another thing I wanted to share, and this is sort of a, on a different top, uh, different, uh, different gears, which is to share that, and, and it goes sort of to some stuff that we were talking about right at the beginning, which is, I think even when you're planning a Seder that is for kids, it should also be for adults. Okay. Like, I do not believe, so I think that Judaism in general, Judaism in general is a religion that is for adults that emphasizes educating the kids. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's a religion for kids. And I sometimes um, see people or worry that we have a, a sort of idea that Judaism is, because it's so focused on education, that it's really for kids only. And I tell every couple that I marry, okay, that they have to figure out the ways in which Judaism is meaningful to them before they can then pass on Judaism to their kids. Like Judaism, the Seder has to be meaningful to the adults at the Seder. Um, it has to engage your heart and your mind and your, uh, and to exercise your, um, your connections. Now that doesn't mean that it can't also be, right, accessible to a young person and, and, and connected to them. And right, like, I, I think it's, it's like, for example, you can say at the beginning of every Seder, there's no such thing as a bad question, interrupt at any time to ask a question, hmm. right? And, and then you can follow up with that by giving a marshmallow every time somebody asks a question or or a, or a, a a different kind of small candy you know like um to 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 honor the 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 young people who are asking questions but then it's also okay to answer those questions for the young people and for the adults. And in fact, it's not just okay, but I think it's really important. And Bob said something like this earlier, but I think it's really important for the young people at the Seder to see that Seder isn't just for them, but it's also for the adults in their lives. Um, and if that means that a, that a young person takes a nap in the middle of Seder and comes back when they're, when they wake back up, great. If it means that you stay up for Seder as long as you can and then go to sleep, great. Like it, it shouldn't be that, that you have to have Seder be like the shortest, the length that the, that the youngest person could handle. Well, Seder should be for the adults in the room, but accessible to young people. Um, and I, and I really feel strongly about that. I think that that's really important. Now, there's always a balance. You all have to figure that, 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 you know, I'm not saying that it isn't also good to use like a Haggadah for young people, right? But even the Haggadot for young people have opportunities for, adults to be really engaged. 
I think it was the PJ Libraries Haggadah that first came, um, I guess now about four years ago or so for when Charlie was little, that really uh, caught his mother who's not Jewish and she loves it. And they now have six copies of it yeah. so that we can all have them. Yeah, I have, I have like 15 or 20 copies of the, that's what we're going to use at our first night seder at our house mm -hmm. this year. Um, we invited two of Ellie's friends from school and their families. So, nice. um, so that, so that, you know, that'll be, that'll be a, a kid focused theater, but, but right. Our theme is going to be asking questions and I'm, I've assigned each family a section. So one family is doing the, uh, the four children and one family is doing the section of the Seder. That's like the Pesach, Matzah and Maror, the like, the, the explaining the sacred symbols. Um, and one family is, is doing Elijah the prophet. And so like different folks are doing, doing different parts of the Seder and they have their assignments in advance, two weeks in advance. Then I made sure that everybody had a copy of the Haggadah so that they would be able to like get their assignments from the right page. <laughs> um, and I think that like, that's also an important part of, uh, of, 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 of preparing. All right, does anyone have any questions? I was trying to remember, last year we talked about doing some acting, literally acting things out. And I went on a wild goose chase, ultimately finding a strip of red blanket, um, kind of a comfort, a, a small comforter kind of thing. And I was trying to remember what you had thought to how how to use that as the as an opportunity for in our case the kid to cross the Red Sea. Yeah. So um, it, gr it growing up, happen. growing up, I had a comforter that was a two sided comforter, mm -hmm. and it happened to be blue on one side and red on the other. And that was an extremely useful uh, prop that we used every year for uh, for Passover uh, uh, because uh, because it was like it, you could turn the water into blood for the first plague. Mm -hmm. um, and so and so that so that was that, so that was really an important um, uh, so. Right, like if you happen to have something like that, that's a great mm -hmm. thing to do. Um, yes, I, I know people who have, you know, who have collected little paper bags with with the uh, with plague materials for each right. plague. Uh, and when when you get to the plagues, the frogs come out, right? right. And the, and the ping pong balls come out for hail, and right, um, which is very nice, and it like it's very lovely a couple of times, right? You don't want to do that on the first night and the second night, right? <laughs> you want to mix it up. Um, oh, another thing is the songs. You want to find a, a one new song every year to sing. Oh, my, I have, you know, I have the ballad of the four children, said the parents to the children at the Seder, you will dine. You will eat your fill of matzah. You will drink four cups of. But I also have, um, mm. um, I have, uh, um, parsley green number one. That's because spring has begun for its Pesach now. How do we celebrate? See what's on the seder plate. And I have, <laughs> um, this is the dough. This is the dough of woe that we ate our ancestors ate so long ago back in egypt back in egypt back in egypt land. <laughs> oh and i have um uh, uh of course um 
one morning when Pharaoh awoke in his bed, there were frogs in his head and frogs. But so there are a lot of songs <laughs> out there, but like bring a couple like nice, like new songs that are kid friendly songs that, you know, the, 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 that are tunes the kids know, like Knick Knack Patty Whack or, uh, you know, whatever. And, um, uh, you know, and, and, and have everybody sing the songs. Uh, singing is a great way to engage. Um, yeah. Uh, so how else could you use the, the, your, like, um, your blanket? You could have it, you could have, uh, you could have every person uh, get up and walk b- between walls of blankets. You could get mm-hmm. two blankets and have everybody walk between them, have two people holding them up and pretend to walk through the water, walls of water. I think that's a really beautiful, beautiful idea. And then when you get through, you can sing, and the women dancing with their timbrel. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I think that's, that's really, that's really, that, that's a really nice idea. Um, oh, here's another, here's another important tip that I forgot to write down in my preparation, but just popped into my head. Don't stay at the table. Yeah. Don't stay at the table, right? Like in growing up after we ate the like really big vegetable course, uh, we left the table and we moved to the living room and we did most of the rest of the Seder in the living room. Everybody's sitting around, Um, but you don't have to have everybody sitting around. And even if you're very attached to to the table, you should (laughs) have everybody get up and walk around. Like, you know, when you get to the part where they leave Egypt, like get up and leave Egypt, you know? Um, like the the more physical it is, the more accessible, the more, you know, and the more provocative of questions. And the mm-hmm. whole thing is asking questions. All right. Does anyone have any more questions? Well, just a logistical question. Where's a good source of those songs other than you? Oh, is just there... Google. Just Google, just Google Passover Seder songs. You're, there are thousands. Okay. Like and they they've written uh uh to to like every to every song that you've ever heard of they're like there's a sea shanty version of there's just there's like so many songs. okay i like that that's easy i like that i i really do like the idea too and and i remember we talked about that last year about getting up and and not being attached to the table the whole time that and I do think we did that to some extent, uh, and certainly it was really good to just give him <clears throat> our, our grandkid at that point was three the opportunity just to move around with everybody giving him kudos for doing what he was doing as opposed to just sitting and being. He he stayed up surprisingly late that as I remember. Yes, he did. He did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he if didn't, it's engaging people. He didn't have a meltdown. Yeah. Yeah. The next day, the next day, full of meltdowns. Say that again. I'm sorry. I said the next day. It's like it's very nice to be the grandparents, you know. Like, uh, yeah, there was no meltdowns at Seder. That's because you didn't, you weren't there. The next, you know, you didn't see the aftermath. The well, tired we did, child. but we didn't have. We did because we were all in the same house, but yeah. we were in front line. Yeah, as a parent of young kids, I. I get that, you know, but sometimes it's worth it, right? You make a trade-off. Oh, yeah. You say, you say, yeah, you're going to stay up late tonight. And if you're, if you're a little cranky tomorrow or the next day, we're going to get through that. Right. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Diane, did you have something? No, I don't think so. Okay. I thought I had heard. Yeah, maybe not. Okay, great. Any other questions? No, I... I just excited with some of the ideas. Or thoughts or reactions or or just, you know, what brought you to this particular? Well, do you ever, uh, and this isn't pertaining to kids so much, it's pertaining more to the assigning roles and all that. I mean, yeah. sometimes you, you have somebody to the Seder 
who isn't Jewish or who uh, ha, you know is not is not in, as engaged, you know, and to assign them a role to play as something could be on one hand engage them, but on the other hand could repulse them or push them away. Or, yeah, you know, so, so I, 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 I just have, how do you handle that type yeah, of thing? I have found that a lot of it has to do with how you present it. So you send out a letter to everybody that you've invited to Seder. Like, you know, I'm so excited to welcome you to our home in three weeks. Don't forget that Seder is Wednesday night and we're gonna, and we're asking people to gather at five, uh, bring along a pillow so that you have something to recline on. And, uh, and you, there's gonna be another email with your particular, with you know, with your particular assignment, but it's going to be on the theme of, um, uh, of engaging with environmental justice. Okay, environmental justice as a form of moving from slavery to freedom. So you know, we picked environmental justice. We know we're not saying it in the email, but we know we picked environmental justice because the non-Jew that we invited happens to work for the states, for this, the state version of the EPA, right? Okay, so the, the Department of Agriculture of the state. Okay, so we, we, we picked a theme that engages something that we know that that person can engage with. Um, okay, or, you know, and then, and, and that person then sees that everybody is being asked to also do something there's a there's a welcome letter to everybody, you know. And, and by the way, you like feel free to hit reply all to this email and introduce yourself to the other guests who are coming. Like get let's get the conversation started before we even before we even get there. Um, and then uh, uh, you know, and then you send out the private emails. Okay, we'd really like you to present when we get to page seventy seven. Okay. <laughs> When we get to page 40, uh, that's the page where it talks about, and then you you describe what the page is about, and then you give the text, and you say, we'd really like you to share something from your life that connects to that text. Hmm. Okay. And so then you've given them all that they need. And if they're still like really uncomfortable, I, in my experience, People, when they're asked to do that, are not, uh, they're not usually shy. They are usually able to do it. Um, okay. But if they say to you, you know, I'd really rather not. So you say, okay, you'd rather not. You know what? Like, you don't have to tell them this, but you can say in that there are all, all kinds of folks at the Seder, including the one who does not know how to ask. And mm. it's okay to have people who are just taking it in. Okay. I really I like that a lot. I have to say that the the non-Jewish folk we've had have all had many many questions. There has never been a dearth of questions in in No, but see I, and I think that right I've always had non-Jews at my seders too and I think it's really nice like not just for kids but for everybody oh. like to start with saying that there's no such thing as a bad question, like questions are part of this process, you know, feel free to interrupt at any time for a question. No, but also to say every person at this Seder has, a, has an important story to tell. Everybody is engaged in telling this story. And it doesn't matter that you're not Jewish, you can still connect to this, you know, to the, to this story. Now, I know I've done this before, but who is the hero of the Haggadah? Who's the main character? Well, in the story, uh, Moshe is, but he's not mentioned in the Haggadah. <laughs> Great, good. So that's uh, obviously we, we use, like if, if I asked who's the main character of the Exodus story, uh, Moshe is the obvious answer. Moshe is not mentioned in most in many Haggadot and is only mentioned in the in the in the most traditional text of the Haggadah, 
Moshe is mentioned, but only once and very briefly. Okay, but uh, you know, in like a proof text verse that happens to have his name in it. But mm. basically, uh, Moshe is not mentioned. And why is that? The traditional answer: What? Why is Moshe not answered? Not mentioned? Who? Who? Who is instead supposed to be the the primacy of place in the Hag in the Haggadah? God, yeah, God, not a trick God question. A not a trick yeah. question, right? Like the, the <laughs> what we tell our religious school uh, kids uh, when, when we say, "Yeah, Moshe isn't in the Haggadah," we say, right, because we really want to focus on God's power and God as the actor, right? And in fact, right. in our Haggadah, right, God, right, we we quote this midrash, right? God, God's self killed did the plagues, killed the Egyptian right. firstborn, right. right? I am not an angel. I am not a seraph. I am not, right? Which is yeah. not what it says in the text of Exodus, right? right. Exodus uh, says that it's the angel of death. And the song right. says it's the angel of death too. Yeah, right? and the song yeah. says it's the angel of death. Yeah. But, right. right, right. But the, but the, but the, but the, but the Midrash says, nope, I and no other. Okay, right. right, God. God is the main kahuna, right? <laughs> and and yet, I don't think that God is the main character of the Haggadah, right? I do think that we don't focus on Moshe in order to em emphasize or highlight God's power. But I think the Haggadah could not be without Rabban Gamliel, okay? Rabban Gamliel, who says, the you have to talk about these three things right. in order to fulfill your mitzvah of Pesach, and they are Pesach, Matzah, and Maror, right? Rabban Gamliel is like one of these, one of these rabbis, right? Or you, right, and so it, and Rabban Gamliel is a symbol. It's not just Rabban Gamliel, it's it's us, it's the it's the Jewish people, the Jewish people who tell the story. We are the main character of that God. Anyway, I, I I think right you could have a whole seder where you where the theme was, you know, wh who's the main discovering the main character, and at every piece of the seder you could say, well, who was the main character of this piece? Who like who is this is the Haggadah emphasizing in this piece? That is very cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah. So right. then you should, of course, come back to the table. Ah, one other thing I wanted to say. The Haggadah has 14 or 15 steps, depending on how you count them. Let's say 15. Okay. Some people say motzi and matzah are one step, or maybe motzi and matzah are two steps. That's 14 versus 15. I think it's 15. There are 15 steps in the Seder. And the 15 steps are important because there were also 15 steps leading up to the temple. And there are 15 verses of Dayenu. And there are 15 psalms that are called Psalm of Ascent, right? And they were supposed to be read on each of the, of the steps as you were ascending into the temple, right? And uh, um, and the, the Seder is an ascent uh, from degradation to praise, from slavery to freedom, from Egypt to ultimately like Jewish self-rule in the land with, with a temple, okay? So the... There's a there is an ascent in in the Haggadah. The reason why I mention this is because the stuff that happens after the meal, it's not incident incidental to the Seder. It is part of the emotional um, impact of 
the of the meal, right? If you stop at the afikomen, right? You eat your dessert and you have your last piece of matzah and that's it. You miss something. And what you miss is the last three steps of ascending, okay? Now, I, I sometimes worry at my Seder that the last three steps are much less accessible because it's a lot of Hebrew, right? At the Seder I grew up at, we got to the, after the meal, and then we did Birkat Amazon, which we all knew in Hebrew. And it's like, we're singing for like 10 pages in Hebrew. And then we do Hallel, which we all knew, but not everybody who's an invited guest necessarily knows. And that's like another six, 10 to 10 pages in Hebrew. And then it's all of these songs, Chad Gadia and Echad Miodea, all in Hebrew. So you have to figure out a way to not to skip those parts because the emotional impact of them helps in that feeling of ascent. You want to end with that kind of feeling like you've, you've made it to the end, you know, of the Seder. Um, but you have to you have to do that in an accessible way. So I think, you know, figuring out a version of Birkat Amazon that works for the people who are at your meal and figuring out a version of Hallel that works for the people at your meal. And then do the songs, but do some of them in English or when you do Chad Gadya, when you get to each animal, like you go around the table and everybody it gets assigned an animal. And then when you get to that line, they have to make their animal noise, you know? And then came the cat, yeah, right? And ate the kid that my father bought for two zoozing. So you could do it in a, uh, in a way that makes those things accessible. But don't think that just because it's after the meal and everybody is like, ready for it to be over, whatever, that, that you should just skip it. Those parts have an emotional impact in the context of the Seder, even for a little kid, I think. Was it you who suggested rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, thanks for the grub, yay God, as a possible way? Yeah, if that's, I, if that's accessible and that works, for, yeah, I, I definitely have said that in the past. There's an Aramaic version also, that's one one sentence. Uh, Talmud <laughs> says, yeah, Talmud says if, yeah, right. If yeah. Talmud says, if someone someone's uh, chasing you like a bandit's chasing you and you just had your your sandwich, you should say this one sentence and, and, and go. Uh, and it's Brich Rahmana, Malka Dalma, Mari the High Pizza, right? It's the Aramaic version of Rubba Dub Dub. Thanks for the grub, yay <laughs> Um <laughs> Well, again, that would work for a four-year-old. Well, yes, but I mean, look, I, I, I certainly our, like our, our five-year-old and our two-year-old know Shira Malot and the first paragraph of the of the Birkata Mazon because we do it every Shabbat, right? right? Not, so, not. right. So, I, like, there's a way to build this structure over time. Like, mm -hmm. that is to say, it shouldn't just be at Seder. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And we're not doing, we don't do the full Birkat Amazon and we don't do the full Birkat Amazon because we want them to really know the part that we do. So we, we do Shira Malo and the mm -hmm. first paragraph and we've been slowly adding different parts. Okay. So we do a special, we do a Harachaman to show that it's Shabbat. When, when we are on Passover, we'll do a special Harachaman to show that it's that it's Passover so that so that Ellie gets this sense, oh yes, it's a little different tonight. Yeah. All right. Yeah, okay. well, thank you. Thank you. Um okay, so before I'm gonna close off the recording. Uh if you're watching this recording, I hope you were engaged by this and we're gonna we are gonna be sending the recording out in our uh, 
in our next pre Passover email, uh, oh, so people, cool. so people can can watch the recording. Uh, it's about an hour. Yeah, great. Okay. I didn't realize we were being.